I'm going to be very brief. The portrait that you saw of Judge Bork in that video um, is hanging on the wall in the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. I was there the day that the portrait was dedicated. And <clears throat> I said um, a number of things at the time I was a, a participant in the speech. And one of the things I said is that I always talk, when I talk to Judge Bork, I, I refer to him as judge and he snarls at me because he doesn't like that kind of pretentiousness and doesn't need that. And I explained that the reason um, as with so many people in the room that day, Robert Bork should always be Judge Bork. He personifies for me and for so many of us what a judge should be. Formidably brilliant, scholarly, erudite, somewhat impatient with fools, but fundamentally tolerant and forgiving, unshakably honest, deeply principled, and possessing great wit and a wonderful sense of humor. In short, someone whose intelligence, instincts, and judgments we respect and whose decisions are intuitively acceptable. That is my mental idol, uh, my, my, my mental idea of what a judge should be, and that is Bob Bork. That is why I slip sometimes and call him judge, because that is what he will always be to me. Um, to have a conversation with Judge Bork, we have uh, a colleague of his from the D.C. Circuit, Judge Ray Randolph. Uh, judge Randolph uh, has been on the court for a number of years, and I won't spend any time um, introducing him. Uh, he's a, a former Deputy Solicitor General of the United States, someone who argued 25 cases in the Supreme Court before he took the, his position on the Court of Appeals. And I know we're all looking forward to the conversation uh, between the two of them. Thank you both, uh, Judge Bork and Judge Randolph, for doing this for us. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you, you have your micro. Do you have your microphone on? You know, they mentioned that. Um, uh, How old were you when you joined the Marines? I, I enlisted when I was 17. I called up when I was 18. And did you serve overseas? Only in China after the war. D do you know that George Will blames you for the loss of China? <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, he's got a point there. <laughs> uh, because while I was in China, the, the Chiang Kai-shek was sort of hanging on. Then the Marine Corps sent me home and the whole thing fell apart. <laughs> When you came back, you went to the University of Chicago, but you only went two years. Why was that? You mean leave a college? Yeah. In those days, if you took exams, you could place yourself out of courses. That is, I placed out of the math course. I placed out of a lot of courses, so I had two years. And you graduated in, in two years? Right. Yeah. yeah. What, what, uh, what made you decide to go into law? The law? I didn't know. I was, I was torn between law and journalism. And uh, I finally decided I wanted to go to, but I had the idea you had to have a journalist de journalism decree, degree, which was nuts, but I didn't know any better. Uh, so I wrote away the Columbia School of Journalism, said, send me an application. And they wrote back and said, uh, we, won't, we don't recognize the Chicago degree. So if you want to go to school here, go someplace else for two years and uh, another two years of college. That irritated me somewhat, so I, in a fit of pique, I went to law school. <laughs> <laughs> to get even. Hmm? To get even. Yeah. Well, I, do, you know, do you remember your first class in law school? Oh, that was a wonderful class. Uh, yeah, we, we came in, a hundred of us, and sat down. We didn't know what law school was going to be like. 
and we were waiting expectantly. And in the front of the room was a gentleman who had a, a, more than a passing resemblance to Groucho Marx <laughs> with a huge cigar and waggling eyebrows. Uh, that was Ed Levy, it turned out. Uh, and he looked at us for a while and said, uh, I'm not going to keep you long today. I'm not going to keep you long because I've got nothing to say to you. I've got nothing to say to you because you're too ignorant to talk to. <laughs> and it got personal after that. <laughs> His style of teaching was, uh, he would ask a question and point at you, and if you didn't answer instantly or you, or if you got it wrong, he would say, put pennies in that man's eyelids. <laughs> you know, the whole class was like that. The uh, ideas of ricocheting around the room. Plato, Aristotle, August, Augustine, uh, and Westbrook Pegler was pretty wild. And people got wounded. I know people to this day won't give a dime at University of Chicago Law School because of what Ed Levy did to them one day in class. <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of enjoyed it. Uh, uh, but he was, um, despite the fact that he was, he was constantly uh, attacking the students, in a, but in a legitimate way about ideas, uh, at the end of the court, well, you know, any, any law teacher becomes very sensitive to the level, decibel level of the applause at the end of the course. Uh, I never saw anything like Ed's uh, finish. He had to walk up, it was an amphitheater, he had to walk up uh, from the front up the stairs out to the back door. And as he did, the class rose and threw papers in the air and stomped and hollered and whistled. Was a, I've never seen a triumph like that for a classroom teacher. Amazing. He co-taught, uh, you took, anti, we, we just had a panel on the antitrust paradox, and, and, and the panelists were three graduates of the University of Chicago, and you took antitrust from Ed Levy, but it was a co-taught. Yeah, well, that, well that's, that was the beginning of the law and economics movement. Uh, Ed believed the antitrust laws as they stood. He was a young man, he was in the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. And he invited Aaron Director, an economist, in to, to be with him in the course. Well, it had an unforeseen outcome because the director began to say, these cases make no sense. And he would prove that they made no sense. It was that the economics being applied was something that was kind of a folk economics judges made up. And uh, he began to demolish them and seek alternative explanations for the behavior that was in the cases. As a matter of fact, when he, he would try to figure out what was really happening, unlike what the court said was happening, and if he couldn't figure it out, he would send the problem over to his brother-in-law, Milton Friedman, and George Stiegler. And if they couldn't figure it out, they would put it on the graduate record exam for their students. <laughs> <laughs> but in that course, I learned, I learned what I know about oral argument. Because when Aaron Director was closing in on Ed Levy, logically, and Ed couldn't see an escape, he would begin to make fun of the director's mustache, <laughs> <laughs> which is the way to argue a case when you're stuck. <laughs> make fun of the mustache. Or make fun of whatever you can get a hold of. Right. <laughs> so, well, after you gradu graduated, you, uh, you stayed around a year at uh, Chicago, right? I stayed around as a, for a year as a research associate with the uh, director, which, which is where I got my exam. The director was a marvelous uh, guy, but he, as a classroom teacher, he was not terribly inspiring. He was all right, but one-on-one, -on -one, he was tremendous. And he, he would explain it to you once, and if you kept insist, insisted upon being wrong, he wouldn't talk to you again. Uh, he always quoted uh, the episode when John Stuart Mill said to his father, uh, that's all right in theory, but in practice, for which his father sent him to bed without his supper. Because you, 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 if, if, if it's all right in theory, but not in practice, then there's something wrong with the theory. <laughs> he didn't write much, did he, director? Uh, Aaron wrote almost nothing. Uh, I don't know why, but he didn't. His, his publication, in effect, was through his students. And you, in fact, published your, was that your first law review article during that year? Yeah, I, it, was, uh, it was called Vertical Integration and the Sherman Act, the Legal History of an Economic Misconception, which just shows you the way I, I started out. But uh, uh, I, I once 
threatened to call it Error Exposed and Truth Laid Bare. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, then you went into uh, uh, private practice first with a New York firm whose name I can't recall, and then with Kirkland Ellis in Chicago. Yeah. And were you specializing in antitrust then? It was large litigation, 90% of which was antitrust. But, um, and I, for a while, I thought that fi I'd found a permanent home, because the first time you argue a case in court, anything, you know, a motion or anything else, it's, it's an exhilarating experience the first time. <laughs> then reality sets in slowly. <laughs> uh, but I was, you know, it's, it consisted of arguing motions or interrogatories and taking depositions or, or defending depositions. Now, when you take a deposition, you have to be alert and keep asking questions and try to get the guy boxed. But when you're defending, all you have to do is sit there and make sure they don't smuggle something into the question that's going to prejudice the record. Well, that's not too exciting, and these things can go on for days, and there could be 20 such depositions in a case. So I found myself uh, listening to the depositions and, and working the New York Times crossword puzzles at the same time. <laughs> At that point, I knew I was not cut out for a life of practice. That was the time ago. And I began to look for a teaching job, and, and uh, through a combination of lucky circumstances, wound up at Yale. Wait, to go back a little bit, they, you mentioned oral argument, that, and th there's a story you told me a long time ago about, uh, was it uh, Kirkland arguing before Learned Hand? You sure? Uh, well, that, yeah, that was not, I wasn't there. That was the Associated Press case. And Weymouth Kirkland, who was perhaps the greatest trial lawyer of his time. Uh, he didn't, under, every, ni every night they had to explain to him what the case was about again, because he was not, a <laughs> did not have a theoretical mind, but he could charm a jury. And, uh, but he was arguing on appeal before Learned Hand, an associated press case, when a, a clerk came in and handed hand a piece of paper and hand spun his chair around with his back to Kirkland and began to read the memo. And Kirkland stopped talking. And Han said, you may continue, Mr. Kirkland. And Kirkland said, I speak the no man's back. <laughs> and Han swung around the other way and listened to him again. It Did didn't do any good, but. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a friend of yours, um, John McGee. Who was John McGee? John McGee was a fine economist um, who was on with me on the, uh, as one of the research associates in the year with director. with director. He remembers you saying, that, quote, I do not want to spend my life practicing law and cash in at the end, of, at the end leaving nothing but a trail of depositions, briefs, and money. Do you remember saying that? That was two-thirds correct. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask you. <laughs> Did, did, when you were looking for a teaching job, did you ask Ed Levy for help? You wanted to teach antitrust, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he wasn't much help. <laughs> he thought, for one thing, I've been practicing. I've been out for eight years. He thought that was too old. He thought you had to start right away. But Ward Bowman, who was an economist who had been at Chicago and was now at Yale on the law school faculty, made an impassioned plea. And uh, they hired me. They s decided they wanted one conservative, because they never, I guess they didn't know any, and they, <laughs> and they wanted one, uh, so it, turn, it turned out to be me, but they, they knew I was conservative, but when I began to vote Republican, they couldn't believe it, because <laughs> you know, nobody did. Uh, the, um, at that point, I made a mistake, I, 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 well, mistake. I was offered a, a job with Fortune magazine as a writer. And I was offered, uh, at the same time, a half-time position with NYU Law School so I could do both, right? And I wish I could have taken a, that would have been ideal, except that after Ward Bowman had gone out on a limb to get me into Yale, I couldn't very well yeah. abandon it. But um, speaking of, I think I've told this before, but nevertheless, it illustrates something about the Yale uh, atmosphere at that time. Uh, the, in 1964, I'd been there for two years, and the election between Goldwater and Johnson was upon us. And uh, I was sitting in my office when two young men appeared from the Yale Daily News, student paper. 
and they said they were looking for two professors to write, in the entire university, not a lot of professors, two professors to write columns for Lyndon Johnson, for which they had hundreds of applicants, and two to write a columns for Barry Goldwater. And so far, they can only find one. And they had a suspicion that I might be the second. <laughs> well, I did, the, I did the principal thing. I said, go away. <laughs> I haven't got tenure. <laughs> Well, they went away. They understood. So but about three days later, they came back and said, you know, we, we've tried. Two, there's a faculty of 2,000 at Yale, and we can't get another one. So I agreed to do it, and I wrote the column. And the next day, all hell broke loose in the law school. And people kept coming in and out of my office, arguing with me. And very often, at the uh, end, the person who was, was leaving would turn around and say, you must be crazy. <laughs> well, the election came and went. And I was sitting in my office when these two young men showed up again. I was delighted to see them. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, we want to take you to lunch to meet the other Goldwater supporter. <laughs> so they took me to lunch, and I met him, and he was crazy. <laughs> uh, you, you were at Yale from 82 to 73. Did you have any uh, notable students that you can remember? Notable students? No. Um, <laughs> I used to say that Bill and Hillary were my students, but, they, but I no longer say that. I say they were in the room while I was teaching. <laughs> <laughs> but there was Robert Reich, who sat in the front row and talked all the time. There was Jerry Brown, there was Anita Hill, there was Ben Stein, who was a wild radical at the time. And then there was, uh, the only uh, redeeming thing I had was Jack Danforth and John Bolton. Both students. Well, Clarence Thomas was there. They he was there, and I keep talking. I, I, I reproach Clarence repeatedly for not taking a course from me. <laughs> What's his excuse? His excuse was he went to summer school and took antitrust from Gene Rostow when I wasn't teaching, because he wanted to get out early. I can see why he wanted to get out early. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it, I, 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 you know, I keep saying to him, "That's all right, Clarence. Let it pass. Let it pass." <laughs> you could have taken one course. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you started out. I mean, you were hired. Ward Bowman was an economist, and, and it, your specialty, at least in part, was antitrust. And you went to Yale to teach antitrust. I mean, how did it come about? That was there some connection between constitutional law and antitrust? Well, the connection is easy to make. Um, when I went there, they, as a new boy, I got to teach antitrust, but they also loaded me with a seminar on mortgages. There's not much to say about mortgages. <laughs> uh, and uh, after two years of that, I said to them, I'm going to drop the mortgage thing. And they all have an, an anarchic structure. They let you do things like this. So I'm going to drop the course on mortgages, and I'm going to teach constitutional law. Well, they, need, they had a small group program, so if you wanted to teach a small group, you could choose any topic. You could, you could do contracts, of course, constitutional law, so I did. Uh, and I must say, there was no outcry from the students at the loss of the mortgage course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you taught, uh, well, you taught a seminar, but you, you co-taught as kind of like Aaron Director and Ed Levy. Well, I was teaching, yeah, you I, and I, I made up a course Smith? called Constitutional Theory. Uh, God knows what, what, it, what it meant, but I made it up, and I began teaching it, and, and I'd gotten into know Alex Bickle very well. I don't know if you all know Alex Bickle, but he was a marvelous man, best friend I ever had, uh, and a marvelous uh, constitutional scholar, but wrong, <laughs> <laughs> in a very pleasant way, in a very intelligent way. Uh, and he came in and sat in this seminar on constitutional theory. And at the time, I was, uh, I was enthralled to John Stuart Mill and on liberty, which is a bad thing to be enthralled to. Uh, and I, I was teaching the course, I was trying to make up, when I say constitutional theory, I was trying to work out under what circumstances is the state entitled to coerce you to do something, and under what circumstances must you be left free to do what you wish. Well, it's an impossible task, as I later discovered. But I was at it, and I was, came pretty close to being like John, uh, taking John Stuart Mill's position, and I said in class one day that I didn't think unless there was physical touching that you were entitled to stop somebody from doing something. 
And Bickle said, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, he said, suppose I engage in indecent exposure. And I said, oh, don't, don't worry about that. The law has a doctrine already to take care of that. He said, what doctrine? I said, de minimis non curat lex. <laughs> Well, it was the, the famous Indiana Law Journal article, which was talked about this morning. Was, was that your first con law article? No, I'd written some articles for Fortune magazine about con law. Uh -huh. I, did, I wrote for Fortune from time to time, even though I didn't go to work there. And uh, I must say, it was a very healthy, I think my salary was something like $16,000 in those days. And Fortune would pay me $4,500 for a single article. No, that's a, you can't get that kind of money today. Yeah, right. But they were, very, they were very generous in those days. But I wrote for them, and I wrote some nonsense, uh, which I later took back in the Indiana article. Did you, uh, w when's the first inkling you had that you were in line for uh, appointment as uh, United States Solicitor General? Uh, I, I came home from, um, I think it came up, I think it, the roots of it were this. I was called down to Washington along with Charles Allen Wright and some others to work on a, a bill, a busing bill, to try to limit busing for Nixon. And uh, this is 1973. Uh, 72. 72. And uh, before the election, and uh, we met, we worked for a week, Charles Allen Wright and I, and we came up with a bill which I didn't much like because there were some things in it that were bad, and uh, we then went into the cabinet room to meet with Nixon. And there were various cabinet officers around the table and uh, staff and so forth. And I didn't know where, I'd never been in the cabinet room before, so I went over and sat to, on, the, on the long side of the table and went over and sat down, not realizing that was one seat away from where the president sat. Well, he came in and somebody, he was going around the room shaking hands and being introduced to people, and I was the last one he came to. And somebody said, this is Professor Bork from Yale. And he looked and saw a red beard, and he, Yale, and Professor, and he, you know, he recoiled. Because <laughs> he, he, he did not like the Ivy League. In fact, when he offered me the job, he said, it's too bad you went to Yale. And I said, I didn't go to Yale, I went to the University of Chicago. He said, it's almost as bad. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, uh, during the course of that meeting in the cabinet room, I said that in order to uphold this bill, this major portion, you'd have to rely upon a, a Katzenbach case, I think was the name. McClunk hmm? or Morgan? Pardon me? Katzenbach versus Morgan. Yeah. And I said, that's corrupt constitutional law, and this administration should not rely on it. And Nixon looked over and said, I believe that, but I didn't know there was a professor in the United States who believed that. And I think that may be where the germ of the idea of yeah. Solicitor General started. I didn't find out anything about it. Until I came home one evening, and uh, my wife was off with my uh, Robert, my oldest son, and uh, looking at the colleges. And I came in, and my second son and my daughter were watching the Avengers, which I used to do with them. I sat on the floor, and we were watching it. And the phone rang, and I picked it up, and uh, I said, "They said it's uh, Attorney General K uh, Kleindienst." And my son said, "Oh yeah, he's been calling you all day." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he said, asked me if I were offered the Solicitor General's job, would I accept it? And I, in a very modified and controlled tone, I said, you bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And so off you go. But you don't go to uh, Washington and you don't become Solicitor General until the end of June, 73. Yeah. The end of the Supreme Court term. So. You know, you have a nice relaxing summer because the court is... Oh, it was serious. a wonderful summer. Yes, there was yeah, uh, yeah. nothing but serenity. Right. The first thing that happened was I got a call from Al Haig, I'd never met, to ask me to drop by his office, and I did, and he said, the president wants you to resign as solicitor general. I just got there. <laughs> right. <laughs> the president wants you to resign as solicitor general and become his chief defense attorney. And it seemed to be odd. In Watergate. Hmm? In, In Watergate, Watergate yeah. yeah. And... Uh, he described the fact, the fact that the legal staff he thought was in disarray, nobody was in charge, and I would be in charge. Well, I just had just enough sense to say, give me 24 hours. 
think about it. And I got, Alex Bickle was in town that night doing something else, and I called him up, and he came over to the house. And we drank spirituous, spirituous liquids <laughs> uh, far into the morning while we discussed it and decided I did not want that job for a variety of reasons. So I went back and made the best oral argument I ever made in not very good condition uh, about why I shouldn't take the job to Haig. I must say, I, Al Haig, I, I admired greatly. I thought he performed magnificently throughout the period as chief of staff. In fact, I was for him for the presidency after that. But uh, I, uh, among other things, I said, I have to hear the tapes if I took the job. Oh, I said, how will people know I'm in charge? Are you going to give me a title? He said, no, 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 but you'll be the only one with access to the president. And I said, until I give the wrong advice, and then I'll sit by a phone that doesn't ring. He said, that's very perceptive of you. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, we went on, and he, I said, I have to hear the tapes. He said, No, you can't hear the tapes. This president feels so strongly about those about the office of the presidency. If he's ever forced to give up those tapes, he'll burn them first and then resign. And I started to say, In that case, why does he burn them now? You know. <laughs> uh, But then I, s I had a sudden vision of them burning the tapes in the Rose Garden and saying, we're doing this on the advice of this little of this <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't say it. Uh, and then, uh, and then. Well, then th after yeah. that, came up, up came, uh, was it Spiro Agnew? No, there, there was the bombing in Cambodia, which was a right. mess, because uh, Douglas Douglas issued a state saying we couldn't bomb in Cambodia, even though the president and the Congress had worked out a schedule for but anyway, uh, I got the court to override Douglas. But then the next thing I think was Spiro Agnew. This was all during the summer while the I, I hadn't, uh, nothing had happened yet. I, 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 just, I just came down from Yale and all of a sudden I'm in the middle of this <laughs> hurricane. Um, well, they called me, uh, uh, Haig told me when he tried to get me to take the job as defense attorney that Spiro Agnew had been on the take. And that uh, Nixon's well, vice president. Yeah. Nixon's vice president. So uh, anyway, when I got back, I was sitting around the Department of Justice when uh, Richardson, Elliot Richardson, the Attorney General, called me in and said we have this problem with the vice president who was taking bribes. Uh, now the bribes that must be said in Spirit Agnew's defense were bribes when he was governor, <laughs> 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 and they were. They were merely paying him off in the White House, in his office. They were, I, guess, I guess it must have been a form of installment payment. I don't know <laughs> what it was. Uh, and uh, he said, what do we do? And initially, they didn't know what to do. And I said, you have to indict him. So we, we finally agreed we had to, indi had to indict him. But then the White House did objected. Now, there's a theory going around that Nixon masterminded this thing in order to get rid of Agnew. That's uh, quite the Quite the contrary. Nixon did not want to indict Agnew. We went over and met with Haig and uh, Len Garment and Fred Bizarre and uh, Charles Allen Wright and so forth. And they beat up on us for some period of time saying, you can't indict Agnew. And we kept saying, we got to indict Agnew. We regarded it as, well, anyway. After an hour of this, they said, Haig said, let's go see the president. And Elliot said, we have to stop in the men's room first. Now, we didn't have to stop in the men's room, but he wanted a chance to talk. So we went in the men's room, and it was so, we were so paranoid in those days about what was bugged and what wasn't bugged, we turned on all the faucets <laughs> and whispered so that, so that he could, they couldn't, anybody bugging us couldn't make up what we were saying. And Elliot said, this, I think this is a resignation issue. I said, it certainly is. So we went in, and what was, Nixon said, I must say, I never saw Nixon, but when he was very good, he was highly intelligent, balanced, good judgment. There was another side I know, but I never saw the other side. Nixon behind his desk with his feet up on the desk, and Richardson sat to the Nixon's right and Haig to Nixon's left, and Bizarre and I sat in front of Nixon. And Bizarre and I debated the issue for some time. 
And I debated it both on legal grounds and, and also on political grounds. And after about an hour of this, you know, and, and Nixon would say, what do you say to that, Fred? And, and what's your answer to that, Bob? And he was very good. After about an hour of this, he said, well, I guess you have to indict them. And I thought Hagan and Bazaar were going to fall off their chairs because they'd been, they'd been sent out to beat us up for an hour, and all of a sudden it was going the other way. Uh, so we did. We indicted Agnew. Uh, the Speaker of the House sent us a letter saying that we were usurping the House's constitutional function to impeach by indicting Agnew first. But we, uh, we wrote him back a letter saying, uh, which I suggested, saying that uh, if we didn't indict now, all kinds of statutes and limitations were running out. And we had to indict. But we would, in a spirit of comedy, that's I-T-Y, not. <laughs> uh, we would uh, delay. We would indict him and then delay and give the House time to impeach. Of course, they had no interest in impeaching at all. So we, we indicted them, and at that point, uh, and then um, Agnew's lawyers, very good lawyers, with a weak case, uh, wrote a brief saying that we could not indict him until he'd been removed from office upon conviction on impeachment. And we wrote a reply brief. It was uh, Keith Jones and Ed Kitch and I. We worked all week on that and another brief about Agnew. And finally finished up Saturday night and filed the brief. Subsequently, the trial judge told me we would have won. <laughs> yeah. uh, clear. But I had my first argument Monday morning in the Supreme Court. I'd never been to the Supreme Court before. And I hadn't looked at anything except Agnew. You know, I <laughs> hadn't looked at the case. So I spent Sunday at the office uh, desperately reading briefs and that we'd filed and see what the hell I was arguing and argued my first case in the Supreme Court Monday morning. Now, uh, it turned out I wasn't nervous at all because the, the, the pace had been so hectic, I didn't have time to think about it. <laughs> but uh, that was, that was and then after Agnew, I relaxed, and all of a sudden, Archibald Cox gave a television uh, in, uh, press conference, televised press conference, in which he refused Nixon's order. Now, I think, I think Cox was quite right to refuse Nixon's order. Uh, what, was his, what was Nixon's order? Well, Nixon's order was, it was, it was a complex matter. At, at one point, they, you know, Nixon proposed, or his lawyers proposed, that the tapes be reviewed in, uh, be by John Stennis, uh, a senator, to, get, to take out national uh, security matters and just leave the rest of the tapes. Well, it was wonderful. The tapes were almost inaudible as it was, and John Stennis was an ancient man who was deaf. <laughs> um, so that we would still be waiting for the report by this right. now if, if he if accepted that ridiculous offer. Um, he didn't. Uh, but then he got an, uh, an order not to go to court for any more tapes. Uh, now, I wish I'd been at that meeting because I would have asked the question nobody did ask, which is what happens if Cox refuses? Well, it was clear that Richardson was not going to fire him because he had, and properly so, he had, he had uh, Richardson had promised the Senate as part of his confirmation uh, as Attorney General that he would appoint a special prosecutor who could not be fired except for cause, and Cox had given no cause. So, uh, uh, when, but when Cox did that nationally televised refusal to obey, well, he was correct to do it, but he had to be fired at that point. You can't, you know, a, a, a junior officer in the government cannot face down the president in public and expect to get away with it. And they were particularly concerned because there was trouble in the Middle East. <laughs> there, was, there was trouble in the Middle East at the time, and uh, they were worried that uh, Nixon's uh, capacity, uh, capacity for leadership would be questioned. Anyway, uh, they got to me, and because I was the last one in line, it was Attorney General, Deputy Attorney General, uh, uh, Solicitor General, by Department of Regulation. And I agreed to do it, 
and I told uh, Elliot and Bill Ruckelshaus, who was the deputy, that I would do it, but then I would resign. And they said, well, why would you resign? And I said, well, I don't want to be viewed as an apparatchik. <laughs> well, uh, they said, if you do it, don't resign, because the department deserves continuity. Anyway, I did it and did not resign and called together the, uh, all the department heads, which are a great many in the Department of Justice, and explained what I'd done and what was going to happen. <laughs> what was going to happen was I told the prosecution force they were to continue as before. I noticed the headline on the video yeah. at New York Times that said, Nixon abolishes the Watergate special prosecution force. That's not true. Well, it was on paper, yes. They stayed right where they were. Nobody changed except cops. No, nobody. nobody. Uh, no, no, they all stayed in place. And I, I met with the, uh, his deputies, uh, Henry Ruth and uh, Phil Lacavara, right. and told them they were to continue. I, I knew that Cox had to be fired for the reasons I've given, but I also knew that I could not uh, survive myself uh, as uh, if I, I mean, survive in a moral sense if the investigation was closed down. Uh, so I told him to go ahead, and uh, I quite, wh where, where, where was I with this Cox thing? Yeah. Oh, anyway, we, th we then got uh, Jaworski to replace Cox, and it was very funny because Al Haig kept saying, well, now we got a real professional, that's fine. I kept wondering, why do they want a real professional? <laughs> 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 uh, well, then, you know, ultimately, uh, uh, I guess it was uh, August of... 74 that Nixon resigned, 75, I can't 74. remember. 74. 74. And then Ford, the Ford administration, and you stayed on as Solicitor General. Did, uh, and who became Attorney General? Do you remember? Ed Levy. My, uh, there were a lot of Attorneys General going through there. In fact, they were going through so fast, you know, uh, Richardson, me, and Saxby, and uh, so on. And I used to say that instead of an oil painting, they just took Polaroid shots and put them up on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Ed Levy came in, and he was. He had been my first law professor, and he became my last attorney general. Right. So it was kind of a nice rounded career. Do, do, you, do you recall the other? Uh, it was a, a remarkable. Uh, you know, I, I was a deputy, a deputy when, when uh, during that period. But the uh, it was a remarkable Department of Justice. I mean, you should tell the people what the uh, who the others were in that. Well, you mean the criminal division was? You mean uh, the various divisions? Yeah. Dick yeah. Thornburg, who was. Governor of Pennsylvania and later head of the, uh, he was then head of, head of the criminal division, right. later attorney general. Uh, Office of Legal Counsel was, was uh, Scalia. Uh, Civil was. Was Rex Lee then? Yeah, Rex Lee, who became Solicitor General. Yeah, and, and, on and, uh, on and, on and, on. and, and Tom Kuiper, who's a uh, professor of antitrust right. law at the University of Michigan. Well, anyway, uh, Jimmy Carter gets elected, and yeah, uh, well, that things yeah. happen, and <laughs> and and you go back to Yale. Actually, after Carter was elected, there was somebody that was advocating um, that Carter appoint you uh, to the Supreme Court. Yeah, that that was Edward. A little known story. I know that was Edward Bennett Williams, and it's it's it's, it's in a book by Evan Thomas, uh, and 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 Edward Bennett Williams told me he was going to do it, and I kept saying, why would you? <laughs> Asked Jimmy Carter to appoint me to the Supreme Court is ridiculous, <laughs> but he did, yeah. and uh, I think uh, with a predi predictable result, they probably yeah. they probably thought Williams was certifiable. And uh, and, and it, it, all the while, while you were in the Solicitor General's office, the the antitrust paradox was basic. You were basically finished with that, weren't you? That's right, but I didn't I didn't want to publish it while I was Solicitor General because people would come in and say, uh, you said in the book, and you must you, you, and, and therefore. Whereas I was, I was committed to uh, enforcing the department's, the administration's antitrust policy, and not my own. Uh, you you gave a, a f what became a famous speech. It was uh, embodying the Bork wave theory of. Uh, oh well, but, that was. But yeah. but here's what you said. This was at, to the Philadelphia Society. So, I first started at, when I first started at Yale, I thought the intellectual content of antitrust was corrupt beyond redemption True. and would be kept that way by political forces hostile to the free market. 
That accounts for the tone of much of my early writing, sarcastic and confrontational. Of course, you, you toned down. So yeah. <laughs> and, and then you said, I, I, I thought if you couldn't win, at least you could cause pain on the way out. <laughs> True. D do you think you underestimated the power of ideas? No, I overestimated the, the, the political opposition. Uh, if you look at uh, what happened to antitrust, the professional opinion gradually lined up behind the consumer welfare hypothesis and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, the side I was arguing for won, except in one area, and that was resale price maintenance. Uh, because there, there was political opposition. The discounters mm. came banded together and, and stopped anything from going forward. And we may get rid of the resale price maintenance rule, we hope, because Ted Olson just argued the case in the Supreme Court, which would, at last, end the idea that resale price maintenance is a per se violation of the Sherman Act. The, uh, the, the Federal Society was just beginning when you were. Oh yeah, that was that was that was a riot. I, uh, <laughs> there was there was there was some suggestion that uh, I was. There was some truth. Was I was I was at the first meeting of the Federal Society, which was held in a small room, a classroom at Yale. I remember it quite well because there was a, the critical legal studies movement was at its height then. And there was a Harvard professor, a historian, I think it was Horowitz, <coughs> I believe, who spoke to the assembled gathering and gave the critical legal studies movement's uh, manifesto. He said, the first year of, of law school is designed deliberately to destroy students' minds by requiring them to reconcile the irreconcilable and to justify an obviously unjust society. And then he says, I have to catch a train, I can't take questions, and trot out the door. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have? Who's in charge here? 15, 20 minutes? Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, and you come back to Washington, um, the, uh, and back to Kirkland and Ellis, right? They yeah. They had this, uh, I remember, I s you said, come see my new office, and it was just magnificent. They had it all wood lined and beautiful bookcases all set up for you. And, and I didn't get much, spend much time there. And within a matter of a short period of time, next thing you know, you're nominated for the, uh, the D.C. Circuit and sworn in. But did Mary Ellen come to your swearing in at the D.C. Circuit? No, I've, I've always been up, upset by that. She didn't show up. <laughs> no, she, not, she, she occasionally says, but she didn't know me then. <laughs> <laughs> but I regard that as a lame excuse. <laughs> uh, dear. Um, and and y after, what, five years, you were pretty much uh, at the point of diminishing returns if you got any returns. I was gonna re no, I was going to resign from the court anyway. Uh, and my, my clerks know that because I didn't, I, when everybody else interviewed the higher clerks for the following year, I didn't. I figured if, if I changed my mind, I could always pick up some clerks, but I was going to get so off the court. But in the summer of 1987, um, you got a call to uh, go down to the White, go to the White House. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, you remember the joke? You, I mean, you went in to see President uh, Reagan. It was about your you know, nominating you, and, and you, you made a joke. Do you remember the joke you told him? Not offhand. You, he you said, uh, he said, I'd like to nominate you for the Supreme Court of the United States. And he said, uh, let me think about it for 10 seconds. Okay, I accept. <laughs> and he, did, he was unsure whether you had accepted or not. Yeah. <laughs> you <True>. never know. <laughs> anyway, uh, how did you prepare for the hearing? Well, first of all, this is, when was the nomination? It was in the summer, right? Uh, yeah, summer or spring, I can't remember which. June 4th. June 4th. 4th. June 4th. Um, that was 20 years ago. And, yeah. and uh, it was mentioned, I think George Priest mentioned, that it was right at the time of Iran-Contra, and the president was all wrapped up in that, and the, there were no hearings during the summer. Well, the president had just suffered a, a lot of damage on Iran-Contra, and he withdrew from combat, went out to the ranch and stayed there, uh, with the result that there was no, uh, there was really no White House push. Yeah, and uh, uh, President uh, Senator Kennedy issued a, a, oh yeah. a vicious and false statement 
the day or the day after, maybe the day you were nominated. Well, saying, Forty-five uh, minutes. Was yeah, Robert was Bork's nominated. America's back alley abortions and segregated lunch counters and rogue police into the bedrooms at night and you and you, you can't, can't teach evolution. Yeah, it's the evolution part that really got to you, wasn't it? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know where that one came from. I, under <laughs> I understood about the uh, rogue police because, I, along with the other rest of the court, I'd upheld police entries in, in a variety of cases, yeah. but so would other people on the court. Uh, and I understood about the uh, back alley abortions because I wanted to overrule Roe against Wade, which would not lead to back, uh, back alley abortions. Let me let people vote on issues. Right. Anyway, right. but where the evolution thing came from, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, then, uh, well, over the summertime, you made courtesy calls, and you made a courtesy call on Senator Kennedy. Oh, yeah. Kennedy. Yeah, I, I went to, uh, they, they varied a great deal, but we went to see Kennedy. And uh, it was very odd because he was, he, uh, I was sitting where you are, and he was sitting here. He kept looking at the floor, and he wouldn't look at me. And he said several times, nothing personal, nothing personal, you know. You sound like the Godfather. <laughs> 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 We're going to take you out and, uh, and execute you, but it's only business. Yeah, it's only business. And, and, and Senator, uh, well, who was chairman of the judiciary? It was the, it's Democratically controlled. Biden, Biden, I think, yeah. He, uh, he was forced out of uh, his, uh, his uh, race for the, nom the Democratic nomination for president by the fact that he had plagiarized a speech by a labor leader in England who himself had plagiarized it. It, was, it was, uh, must have been a good speech. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and when Biden had to get out, during the hearings, he had to resign or withdraw his nominees. Anyway, you wrote. And he came down to me and said, uh, yeah. "You know, I've had my own troubles. As you and I are in very similar situations, <laughs> which I didn't think was true." <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think you wrote in your "Tempting of America" book that that ended Biden's chance for the presidency forever. I, w I had hoped so. <laughs> Uh, it's amazing. Uh, well, the su subject of who we get to run for president is a subject for another occasion. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, the the hand writing on the wall, did I get that right, Mary Ellen? Uh, was there as as the one Democratic uh, senator after another announced after the Judiciary Committee vote that they were against you, and it was pretty obvious that uh, you couldn't garner a majority. No. But uh, as the video pointed out. You decided to put them to a vote. Why did you do that? Well, let me, let me go back first. Well, one of the things about the uh, that was an odd period. You couldn't go out the, in the morning to get the paper because it was the press camped out there 24 hours a day. Uh, but Mary Ellen had the idea that it, it became increasingly an ordeal. I couldn't read anything but the sports pages because everything else was about what, what a rat I was. Uh, and then, uh, then somebody took a shot at me on the sports page. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if you, if you so, uh, yeah. so Mary Ellen said this, this ordeal should be uh, alleviated by if, if we read a psalm every morning. Well, I wasn't much in favor of that, but she was. So I, you know. And I realized it was a good idea because we came to the third psalm, I believe it was. May the Lord break the teeth of my enemies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if we want to go back a little bit, that, that it, the uh, one of the longest exchanges that you that you had with one senator on one topic was with Arlen Specter about uh, clear and present danger and brand. Oh, that was yeah, was yeah. sheer intellectual excitement. <laughs> <laughs> you you uh, after the after the hearings, um, the fall of '87, and then. Uh, through the winter. You became uh, a public figure. I mean, you were recognized everywhere, weren't you? Well, yeah. I guess, of course, the beard didn't help because I, that, that identified me. But one of the things that happened, what well, people used to come up and say, anybody ever tell you you look like Robert Bork? <laughs> <laughs> and I would say there's a reason for that. And they'd say, no, I didn't go off. You know, <laughs> they, uh, but also, people came up and, well, I remember one woman, it's typical. I was standing uh, in a building in New York City, and a woman came up and said, sir, we are heeding your warnings. And I said, what warnings? 
She said, you're the Surgeon General. <laughs> Remember C. Edward Cooper who had a beard? Uh, and I thought it was a little odd because I was smoking a cigarette at the time. <laughs> Coop, Coop told you he had the same problem. Yeah, Coop, so I met Coop once, and he said uh, people came up, came, kept coming up to him and saying, "Sorry, you didn't make it." <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you: after you uh, you left the DC Circuit in 1988, and then you uh, and you wrote well, you wrote a series of books: slouching, tempting, coercing. Was, it, was, was there a theme that you were? Uh, yeah. <laughs> The next one is going to be um, one I no I I said I promised Mary Ellen that I would she got sick of people saying I was a grouch or a curmudgeon so I promised her I'd write a, a cheerful book and it's going to be called uh, Little Mary Sunshine. <laughs> Unfortunately, Cato Byrne was present in front of a crowd and said, "Don't believe him. It's going to be called Little Mary Sunshine Gets Skin Cancer." <laughs> <laughs> I, I but I have a, I have a, I have a book uh, that I'd like to write about martinis because the martini is, is a much uh, abused drink now with all these chocolate martinis and so forth <laughs> coming out. <laughs> and it starts with people putting olives in the damn thing. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, olives is, is the first sign of degradation. Yeah. And so the title of my book is going to be The Road to Hell is Paved with Olives. Is this a, another exercise in originalism? I have a problem about originalism with martinis because the original martini was a miserable mess. It was <laughs> sweet gin, four to one, and so forth. But I will, uh, I will point out that uh, you know, there, there are things like uh, constitutionalism, in which originalism is the only answer. On the other hand, the Roman Catholic Church has also has tradition that builds up over time, so I will appeal to the latter uh, tradition in order to uh, escape the, the charge that I'm tampering with the original martini. I see that uh, Tony Blair, yeah, have you talked to Tony Blair? Are you, are you no, following your example of uh, conversion, do you know? Yeah, but, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to go into that and what we can expect there because that family is, it's, it's uh, disagrees with the church on some fundamental yeah. matters. Yeah. Well, we have uh, consumed the almost the entire period allotted, and you wanted to be able to take questions, so uh, why don't we do that? If anybody has any questions they'd like to ask Judge Bork, raise your hand. Drew, you were a young socialist as time portrayed, and what turned into <coughs> conservatism? Oh, yes. I was, I was a very fierce socialist. In fact, uh, maybe verged into uh, more radical than that. I was 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I was always taken up by theory, and I read, I read a book called The Coming Struggle for Power by John Strachey, which was an international bestseller and a, an argument for communism, and I was taken by it and became a considerable pest to everybody who knew me. I, w I was editor-in-chief of the school paper at the time and wrote a w wonderful editorial advocating the nationalization of all industries. <laughs> and uh, they, sent the they sent the superintendent of schools down to see me. And after uh, extensive reasoning with me, which had some coercive overtones, <laughs> uh, the editorial did not run. But, uh, you know, the, the socialism really <coughs> <coughs> continued up through uh, <coughs> a lot of college. And I remember I, I, I had a course from Maynard Krieger, who was, had run for the uh, uh, vice president on the socialist ticket. And I asked him to write, him, asked him to write me uh, a, a, a recommendation to the law school. He said, don't go there, they'll change you. Well, they did. <laughs> uh, I, I went in as a socialist. Then I ran into the Chicago economist who 
destroyed what I thought I knew about socialism, how it would work, so that uh, oh yeah, <laughs> Marilyn asked me to tell you the story about Aaron Director when she and I visited him when he was in retirement, and we had lunch with him at the Stanford Faculty Club. And uh, Aaron knew that Mary Ellen had been a nun, and he was not sure, you know, what that meant. <laughs> uh, who was sure? Uh, and he was being very gingerly about it. And I said to him, Aaron, what are you working on now? He said, well, I'm, I, I'm interested in studying organizations that have been persistently hostile to the free market. I said, you mean like the Roman Catholic Church? <laughs> He said, well, yes. I said, well, what about it? And he said, well, he was working on the problem of celibacy, which he thought was a profit-maximizing profit device for the church. It's kind of like primogeniture. So, you know. And uh, Mary Ellen said, you're overlooking the, the sacrificial aspect. And Aaron said, all profit-maximizing devices have their costs. <laughs> And the next day as we were driving out of town, I said, what do you think of Aaron? And she said, he blew my categories. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bork, in the back here. Um, on one of the early panels this morning, Jonathan Turley was speaking of the confirmation hearings of Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, and he referred to them as contentless. And he contrasted that with your hearing 20 years ago, which you described as refreshingly honest in terms of the fact that you as the nominee were forthcoming with your views, whereas the confirmation hearings now, he said that those hearings have gotten away from that. And I was curious for your take on, on hearings in general for Supreme Court nominees. Do they need more content? Is it good or bad how it's going now, no matter who's in control of the White House, of the Senate, whoever the nominee is? What's right about it? What's wrong about it? What needs to be fixed in your view? Uh, I wouldn't uh, criticize uh, John Roberts or uh, Mr. Alito uh, because they didn't get into arguments with the senators. Uh, I think uh, the only reason I did, I suppose, was I'd written stuff that was directly on point. You know, I'd written criticizing Griswold and not Roe, because Roe hadn't come down yet, but I'd written criticizing the court rather severely, and it was quite clear to my opponents that I was going to vote to overturn Roe against Wade, which I think was the crux of the matter. There was more, but that was the crux. Uh, well, you know, if, uh, if I hadn't written, you know, if the writing hadn't been being distorted, I'm not at all sure that I wouldn't have taken the tactic of saying I can't discuss that. Seems to me that's the way things are now. That's the way you have to behave. Uh, Scalia did it. Scalia hadn't written on the subject, on the uh, relevant subject, and uh, neither had Alito or, or Roberts. Uh, now, if you want to, you know, if you want to have a Donnybrook. Yeah, you can you can uh, lay out your views on all these things, but I don't think it gets. You know, I, if I were the president, I wouldn't want a guy to do that because I want if I if I want him confirmed, I don't want him to get into that kind of a wrangle. So it's unfortunate, but the, but it's become politicized, and I suppose you have to play it from a political angle. Professor Beckel taught a class to get <laughs> yeah, together. I just wondered if you could talk briefly about that. Uh, did what? You and Professor Bickel taught a class together, uh, which had quite a, quite a reputation. I wondered if you could talk briefly about that. Well, it was, it was the class I mentioned earlier, a seminar about uh, constitutional theory. And we, Alex and I were very good friends, and, but we used to belt the heck out of each other in class. And the students loved it because they loved to see two professors whacking each other. 
Uh, and it was, it was the best time I ever had. The first five years at Yale before the student radicals hit were the best five years of my professional life. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we got into all kinds of things, but I remember one of the things we got into was the question of somebody, a, a, a ship is going down and there's only room for 15 people in a lifeboat and somebody offers to sell somebody else his seat in the lifeboat. And uh, should that be honored? We got into that kind of thing. We also got into an argument about, and, and as a result, one of the professors, other professors used to drop in because it was kind of a show. Uh, one of them made a, a lifeboat game, like Monopoly, out of that. But I remember we had these, I remember a dean of some law school dropped in at a day when we were arguing about whether workers in a free enterprise uh, society were more like trees or whales? <laughs> well, if, if they're like trees, you take care of them because you, do, you, want, you don't want to use them up. Uh, you know, the pe person who owns, the, the company that owns Timberland is careful to reseed and so forth because he doesn't want to cut it all down and go out of business. On the other hand, if they're like whales, which nobody has any property rights, you tend, uh, you tend to over overkill so that they you know, disappear. And the question was whether you workers needed certain kinds of protection because they were more like trees or more like whales. And this, this, this dean walked in at the middle of this conversation and I he couldn't believe what was going on. <laughs> did, did you take a position? Yeah, I thought they're more like trees. Mm. And Bickle? He thought they're more like whales. <laughs> <laughs> There is a, uh, you know, I neglected to mention, in fact, uh, you, you talked about your work in progress on the martinis, but there's another book that is being put together involving you, right? Well, there are a couple. There's one, uh, Intercollegiate Studies Institute wants to put out a collection of my writings. Uh, and then uh, I'm, f I'm under contract to write a book called Freedom's Paper Trail, the discussion of documents leading up to and through our Constitution, starting with Magna Carta. Uh, B B Bickle and I taught a course in the First Amendment together, and he, he w I don't know if you know, but he was a rabid admirer of Edmund Burke. And of course, uh, and uh, Bickle was Jewish, which is, which is relevant to this story. And we, we were arguing in class, I was arguing for a theory of what judges could do, and he was saying, no, no, it's just a tradition. And I finally said, uh, Mr. Bickle's uh, judicial philosophy is a combination of Edmund Burke and Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> tradition. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Bob. Oh, yeah. All right, all right. Thank you. Thanks. Sit down. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Bork. Thank you, Judge Randolph. That could not have possibly have been better. I think I speak for everybody in this room. That was fantastic, and thank you.